Hello, everyone. We are so excited to have you here with Springtide Research Institute today for this special panel on uh, this wonderful adaptation of Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret. We're excited to have this panel to discuss not only that movie, but all of the wonderful themes contained within it. I am super excited to have this wonderful panel of amazing humans here today to have this discussion. Um, before I let them introduce themselves, I'm Dr. Angela Patterson, head writer and editor at Springtide. And in case you don't know, we study the inner and outer lives of young people 13 to 25. And it just so happens that sometimes we have a wonderful piece of pop culture that aligns with exactly what we do. And that is understand what makes young people tick, how they grow, how they change, how they learn. So we're excited to dive into this topic. I will uh, start with Reverend Natalie and we will do our introductions. Hi, I am Reverend Natalie um, Renee Perkins. My pronouns are she, her. I am um, on Lenape land in Harlem in Manhattan. Uh, in the city of New York, um, and, and I am a, uh, I'm the minister for worship and, and online community at Middle Church. I serve as a spiritual life advisor, which is also known as a chaplain at NYU. Um, I am a writer. Uh, my book is coming out June 13th, In Trembling Boldness, Wisdom for Today from Ancient Jesus People, and I'm also a professional actor, so I feel like I meet this movie at a lot of intersections. Um, so I'm so happy to be able to be in conversation about it. I um, found this movie intriguing <laughs> in a way of, of, of a, I know I've read this book. It was like so uh, tr transforming for, my, for me as a child and I didn't remember it at all. So it felt, so familiar and also so brand new at the same time. And I really just loved having that experience. It, it felt really comfortable to sit there and know that I was like held and safe by this thing that I had already experienced. I don't remember any of the religious pieces at all as a thing <laughs> when I was a kid. There are things that I remember much more clearly. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was a really wonderful Thing to experience. I feel like you don't really get that in a movie generally. It's funny you mentioned that. My friends and I said the same thing. When was this interfaith thing? I don't remember this at all. <laughs> at all. <laughs> I'm glad to know I wasn't the only one. Okay. But when she like wrote the, when she turned the letter into her teacher for some reason, I was like, oh, I remember that. Like there's yeah. just little tiny things, you know? Yeah. Digesting a book with a kid brain. This is what we get. <laughs> Rabbi Karen. So hi, everybody. My name is Rabbi Karen Aviv, and uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm on Ute, Arapaho, and Cheyenne land in Denver, Colorado. I'm the rabbinic director at Judaism Your Way. We're an open tent for anybody seeking Jewish connection. I work with a lot of emerging teens in our open tent B mitzvah program, which is a two-year Jewish coming of age program. And the thing I really loved about this movie was um, taking me back to the 70s. I am a child of the 70s. And also the awkward uncertainty and fear and like deep desire to belong that is middle school and emerging adolescence. And I too did not remember the interfaith piece at all. And we have so much to talk about on that topic. Glad to be here. Thank you. Rabbi Esther. Hi, I'm Rabbi Esther Azar. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I live on Lenape land in New York City as well. Um, I, ha I am currently writing a book on, um, I wrote this down so that I wouldn't forget, the ways intergenerational trauma impacts the Jewish community in regards to anti-Black racism, anti-Semitism, and Israel-Palestine. And uh, in the past, I've worked with um, children and adults and parents um, in creating engaging ways uh, to relate. Engaging ways to relate using a trauma lens so that I am making sure to engage people 
in deep ways. And uh, watching this movie was um, picked up on all of my religious, my religious trauma. And uh, I, at the end of the movie, when Margaret gets really angry at her family members, I was like, yes, me too, me too, religion stinks. And then I remembered that um, I'm not a rabbi because of religion, I'm a rabbi because um, I connect to something greater and bigger than myself. And um, finding those places has, uh, finding those places of connection has been really healing and helpful for me on my journey. So I'm so excited to be here and talking about this. Wonderful, thank you. Pastor Alicia. Hi, I'm Reverend Alicia McClintic. I use she, her pronouns, and I prefer to go by Pastor Alicia in my regular ministry context. Um, I pastor a small church in a small town in central Washington on Yakima tribal land. I'm a solo pastor in a small church, and that means I do everything from preaching to plunging toilets and kind of everything in between. In my free time, I read a lot. Before seminary and uh, vocational ministry, I earned a BA and an MA in literature and spend some time teaching. Uh, and I love getting extra nerdy about books. So this uh, confluence of um, a classic from my childhood and a new film adaptation is just delightful. I'm the pastor and preacher I am because I was first and foremost a student of literature. And I just love being able to open up really deep human spiritual conversations through the lens of fiction. So I'm super excited for our chat today. And I especially love that this film highlights so many beautiful, authentic, heartfelt questions, just even from the title, right? Are you there, God? It's me, <laughs> Margaret. Um, and I would love to explore a little bit more about the questions that Margaret is asking and the adults and other kids in her life are asking, and then maybe what this story is asking of us. And so I'm looking forward to our chat today. Pastor Alicia, you teed us up so perfectly to start these questions. First of all, let's talk a little bit about Margaret. In the film, we see that Margaret is juggling a lot of change, new town, new school, puberty, etc. And she's starting to define who she is in the midst of this change. This includes considering her religious identity. What's been your experience with young people who are in similar stages um, during these key developmental periods. What are the experiences they're having regarding their faith and spirituality? And what questions are they looking to y'all for guidance on? And Rabbi Karen, if you could kick us off on this, that would be great. Yeah, these are great questions. Um, I'll just speak about what I observe in uh, the Jewish communities that I serve. Um, being Jewish is so much more than simply defining it as religion. It can be culture, it can be ethnicity, it can be um, historical trauma that we inherit, it can be internalized anti-Jewish racism. And I have found that the kids that I work with are really curious and open about Judaism and Jewish culture and learning and they're often living inside families where the adults have deep ambivalence and distress and confusion and unprocessed trauma about their own connection to Judaism. And they don't know where to start in like unpacking all of those difficult feelings and experiences. And they come to my organization, Judaism Your Way, saying like, here, deal with my kid. They want to learn. And I don't know what to tell them. And so um, I often find that the work I do um, that I didn't see in the film is helping kids explore based on their own innate curiosity and compassion and like let their learning be guided by their questions and also model tacitly to their parents that engaging with Judaism as a spiritual tradition, as a, a way to belong to a larger resilient people um, can, can be open-hearted and not fraught with anxiety and distress. And so it's like this dual track experience that I guide kids and families through to um 
to ultimately like figure out what is their way within this tradition that can be meaningful and fun and resonant uh, and, and heal some of the trauma that we have inherited, you know, some through history and some through just the experience of anti-Semitism in our world. Absolutely. Do any of y'all see this same kind of dual track, the dichotomy that Rabbi Karen is talking about? Yeah, I do. And and also I would um, add on that frequently the young folks that I'm spending time with have um, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of um, tension that they're trying to wrestle with, and they want to know what God has to say about that. Um, so in the Christian tradition during the season of um, December, it's the liturgical season of Advent, and we're talking about waiting in hopefulness for um, the one who will make all things right. And so we're reading scriptures about God setting things right, God healing the world. Um, and I remember reading a passage of scripture about um, swords being beaten into plowshares, about like tools of violence being turned into garden tools. And one of my kids said, well, Pastor Alicia, why hasn't God done it yet? Why hasn't God done it yet? And, yeah. and she starts telling me about um, how scared she was having to do an active shooter drill at her school, yeah. right? And so just having to show up to say like, I don't know why God hasn't done it yet, um, but but we have, we have this hope that we're looking for, right? So creating space where they can bring the very real hurts and fears and concerns that are plaguing them. And to say that God is here and God is listening, even when you're worried, like God hasn't done it yet. And I mean, we have Margaret here asking all of these questions, God, why haven't you done it yet for me? <laughs> um, about something that, that seems maybe, um, a teensy bit silly as an adult woman as she's like waiting waiting for her period to come but that I remember feeling so intensely as like a younger person and so I think in in my space as as a clergy person as a non-anxious presence is to invite kids to bring whatever it is that they're deeply anxious about and adults too whatever it is that they're deeply anxious about or afraid about and to like have space to ask that question why hasn't God done it yet where is God what what's happening here what does God have to say about this absolutely it's so funny the question why hasn't God done this yet is often the same question that adults are asking it's just kids actually have the nerve to ask it very directly and you God bless them for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyone else have any comment on this particular question? Okay, great. Go, no, go ahead, Rabbi Esther. I was just thinking that, you know, when I was Margaret's age, I wasn't asking these big questions. And I, I don't, mm. I, I was living in a very religious environment and I didn't, there weren't, I, I wasn't asking the questions in this way there wasn't a, a time for it because everything was focused on following the rules. Mm -hmm. And, and now I don't think our kids, even in more religious environments have an opportunity to not ask these questions. Like th there's, they're dealing with so much more than, than I didn't, I didn't know about the world the way my kids know about the world. And there's so much anxiety out there and uh, different existential, you know, questions that they're facing that, you know, I think that um, the movie really gives voice to that stuff that I might not have asked then. And maybe that's why when I read it, I too did not remember any of that stuff. <laughs> right. I just didn't want my period. I was like, why does Margaret want her period? I don't know <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's so interesting what we pick up on at that point. And what we pick up on now and the fact that we find it laughable as women that somebody wants their period. <laughs> um, absolutely. Uh, you spoke of how this is a different time and space that young people today are growing up in, very different than the spaces that we grew up in. I also noticed that Judy Bloom's books were obviously written in a specific time reflected a specific kind of society, but in many ways, what she has written has become timeless. And there's young people today still reading her books, resonating with them. But now they're just a small fraction of the media choices that young people have. They are inundated with all sorts of media and choices um, 
why, Pastor Alicia, do you feel, book maven, why do you feel that it is important that young people be exposed to stories like this, even though they might be from decades ago? Oh, yes. Uh, I can uh, wax eloquent about the, the role of literature for a while, but I'll try to keep it as, as brief as I can. I think literature, especially literature that stood the test of time, um, is really important for young folks to engage with. There's this, there's the end for adults as well, but we're specifically talking about young folks and their formation here. Um, it has the capacity to touch a deep chord of our human experience. Um, and uh, there's this sense that like the more specifically we tell a story, the more universal it can become, right? N none of us had exactly the same experience as Margaret did here in this book. However, it all touched us in a kind of unique way, right? Or it reminded us some of the some of the experiences we had in common and some of the experiences that were different. And that is uh, a really important way to reflect on our experience. John Dewey of educational fame, <laughs> founder of the Dewey Decimal System, says that we don't learn by experience, we learn by reflecting on experience. Mm -hmm. We don't learn by experience, we learn by reflecting on experience. And so engaging literature, reading a book in a slow form, a long form manner, creates all of these opportunities for reflection, to reflect on our own experience, to reflect on the experiences of of others and to stitch them together in a way that helps us make sense of the world and of our place in it. Reading a book is an active exercise in empathy, like especially a book that is written in a first person perspective. Like we hear Margaret in her own voice. And then when you watch the film, there are all of these internal monologues where you hear Margaret particularly talking. And you're basically giving permission for somebody else's voice to take over your own thoughts, your own mind and your heart, right? That's like an active exercise in empathy and in walking in somebody else's experience to let your focus be what somebody else is thinking, somebody else is feeling, what somebody else is experiencing. And that's really important. And something that can happen in a film in two hours can be then magnified in the four or five hours that it would take to read uh are you there god it's me margaret or even over a week say you're reading like 30 minutes a day in your free reading your ssr silent sustained reading in class or whatever right and that kind of extended experience of empathy and reflection is just helping us become generous kind compassionate attentive human beings and that's really important the last thing i'll say is that there's a, a phrase in the book world, um, in the literature world, that we need books that are both windows and mirrors. Windows to show us an experience of somebody else and mirrors to reflect back to us our own experience, right? And we need both of those together. If you're only ever reading books that validate who you are and what your experience has been in the world, you're missing billions and billions of other folks' experience. Um, but if you're only reading about books of people other than you who have had different experiences than you, that can limit our imagination about who we are and how we can show up in the world, right? As a woman clergy person, it was so important for me to see women clergy represented, right? Um, and, and to to have like some words and some stories to validate my own experience or to give me language to talk about things that I didn't know how to put into words. And that's across the board, whether it's a religious experience, a vocational experience, a familial experience, um, a cultural experience, we need stories to help us capture that. And so these uh, classics um, that have stood the test of time are a great entryway into those kinds of conversations. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I would love to add into the book Mavens, <laughs> aka Please, Alicia's answer. Um, I, I think that's just beautiful, the, the, the empathy that is built in a story, right? The reflection that happens um, because you are exposed to the story, both the reflection of, about yourself and then like reflecting on someone else's story that then widens your perspective. And I also think that there is a just a... a unique and special opportunity for um, a child to engage um, an adult in some real questions that they may not have um, known they had before and now have words for, or um, that they were a little shy to ask, but this book has emboldened them, that there's just space for a different conversation. It teaches them 
to start those sorts of things. I'm thinking about the, I don't know if you all saw the story about the little girl who got the um, the sex ed book from the library that like helped her um, be able to tell her mother what was happening to her. That's because of a book, right? So I think that the, the same thing here, right? Like when, when children are exposed, when all of us are exposed, we get to like think through things and then ask out into the world, um, how do I reconcile this with what I think is is the norm for me? is a really powerful change agent. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you brought up having an exchange with others based on what is happening in your own life, what media you might be taking in, using media to um, connect with another person. We've talked a lot about what young people are thinking, how young people are impacted. Let's talk about parents for a second. In one of our latest guides that we've created at Springtide, it's called Nurturing Mental Health for Gen Z, a handbook for parents. We have a section just to help parents think through how they were parented and we and how that might be affecting how they show up as parents. I think Margaret's mom is like the poster child for this. Her experience with faith and how it impacted her relationship with her parents absolutely influenced how she chose to guide Margaret when it came to her faith with a no faith approach. Rabbi Esther, if you can take this one, what has been your experience dealing with those adults who might have had religious related adverse experiences or traumas and how have you seen it affect how they parent? You know, I think that uh, when we parent, we, um, when we become parents, we think that we're gonna come in and give our children something that we've already planned in our heads. We, we have this whole plan of how it's gonna be. And either we're gonna do something like, we love the way our parents parented, so we're gonna do exactly that, or we hated the way our parents parented, so we're gonna do the complete opposite. And, you know, I don't know about, I don't know about you guys, but I did not think, oh, let me let me meet up with this child and see what this child needs. That was not my experience until I had the kid. And then I realized, oh, this isn't going to work. It's not going to work for me to bring in what, what did or didn't work for me as a child. Um, and I think that, you know, that kind of work that parents have to do is really, really challenging. And, you know, parents are really struggling with their own stuff as they show up and parents. And so I, my, a lot of my experience is very similar to Margaret's mom. Like I meet parents that have done the same exact thing. And then their kids are going like this, but we have no tradition. And where, where do we go? And what is this thing? What is this thing called Jewish? And what is this thing called God? And what is this thing called religion? And where do I fit in? And, and how do I navigate um, the spaces in between when when you know Reverend Natalie you spoke about language and having frameworks that is so important for for kids and adults to have and you know it's it's really hard to give frameworks and to have conversations when you have this trauma history around religion and then you're just like you know, having a little bit of panic. And then you call somebody like Karen, Rabbi Karen, and say, can you please take my children for me and fix this up for me? Because I don't know. And oftentimes I see that parents come back through the kids' relationship. And that's where, you know, we have this sudden intersection where like, oh, wait, okay, this isn't so dangerous. There might be a place for me here. It doesn't have to be the way it was. I can bring myself into it. And that becomes healing for the whole family. Absolutely. Any other thoughts from our panelists on this? I have a couple thoughts about parents, um, but I want to pull back for a second. I think I think um, I need to just name that for Jews, using the word faith to frame our lived experience as Jews is actually not the it's not the resonant frame mm. at all. Um, and most Jewish people I know actually don't use the word faith to describe how they connect to their heritage, culture, identity, history, so, for some ethnicity, for some, you know, it's just bland whiteness. Um, 
that's a whole nother conversation we can have another time um <laughs> which has its trauma anyway so uh so for parents it's less about like working out their faith and in fact you see this in the film the differences between margaret's parents um her dad who's obviously a secular alienated um, assimilating Jew who wants to flee to the suburbs because it's bigger houses and more acceptance and inclusion amongst upper middle class white folks. Mm -hmm. And then uh, her mom who clearly has religious trauma, how Margaret's path is framed by these parents is that it's a choice. And in fact, I think that that is not helpful. It doesn't serve kids, at least from thinking about a Jewish standpoint. Um, it's actually not about a kid's choice. It's actually the responsibility of parents to support a child in a community and in a framework um, and with vocabulary and ritual and culture and story. We're talking about a book and story and magic and smells and bells and sounds and music and all the tactile kinesthetic learning experiences that we can give our kids in a spiritual context, it's about offering that and then allowing them when age appropriate, when they're starting to question and emerge into adolescence, to figure out what does this that I've inherited mean to me? And then to turn around and at least in Judaism with a B mitzvah experience, a coming of age ritual, it's to turn around and gather that community and to say, here's what I've learned about myself in relationship to my people and my heritage and my culture and community. And here's what this means to me. And, you know, it's like a Moana story, like to put your shell on the mountain and say, I am part of this people um, in a way that offers deep meaning and belonging in my life. And for parents, at least in a Jewish context to say, here, take care of this. Um, I think, honestly, is an abdication of responsibility, and it's a huge missed opportunity to give a gift to kids. And um, and the reasons why, at least for Jews in the United States, is a different conversation. Um, but it's it's a missed opportunity, and it's also an opportunity to offer some healing. Um, for everybody in a family system and in the larger community. That's the work that I do with the mitzvah kids and their parents. And it's not the work that I saw in that movie. Right. I, I, I didn't see any of that in the movie. And it hurt my heart to watch mm -hmm. this unfolding and to see Margaret try to navigate this in a very ingenious, creative, open-hearted curious way and not have the support of her family to figure it out like yeah. that like when I was watching it I'm like is a chaval which in Hebrew means oh what a missed like what a bummer that they couldn't offer that to her because of their own baggage that they hadn't really healed Pastor Alicia or Reverend Natalie do you feel that the same dynamic occurs in the Christian context I would say it depends on your particular tradition in a liturgical tradition, like the Catholic tradition or the Orthodox tradition or some of our more liturgical spaces. Children are baptized as infants and welcomed into the family of God. You are already born and welcomed into the family of God. And then some traditions even have this naming of godparents whose responsibility it is to care for the spiritual um, upbringing of a child. And then the ba baptismal liturgy and the vows are all toward the community, to the congregation. Will you accept responsibility for caring for this child. And I would say it's maybe the Western white evangelical tradition that leans more into this idea of the age of accountability or a child, a child has to decide when they're ready to be baptized. It's this more emphasis on individuality and individualism rather than the work of the community. Um, but then again, in like liturgical traditions, we, we would have what's called um, catechism, like a, a learning of the of the faith traditions, the kind of core tenets, you learn the creeds, these kinds of things, and then you can come to be confirmed, right? You've already been baptized, you already belong to the family of God, and you can choose and decide what that means to you and how you want to commit to that. That's the, the ideal, most hopeful and beautiful practice, right? And how it gets worked out is, you know, always complicated. Um, but it, it has been my experience in the 
American evangelical tradition that it's a lot, there's a lot more burden of decision making and personal responsibility on this young person who is coming up in a faith, right? And trying to figure out where do we belong? Who are we listening to? Especially I've seen this in kids who have changed churches or who have like moved kind of religious communities. They're like, I, it used to be this way and now it's this way. And I don't know what that means. And um, there's, there's a lot of um, uncertainty. And again, this burden of individual decision-making placed onto the children, which uh, what a bummer. <laughs> it like, it ought to be the community's responsibility for bringing, bringing up a, a child into this openness and and this this space of wondering about who God is and how God has made them and their place in in the world. Um, and and so that's I think that's where I hopefully lean in my particular ministry work that we can um, be a committed community. I am not a mother. I'm child free and unpartnered, um, but I love being an antsy as well. And so thinking about the other adults that are involved in our child's life. And so to come back to what Rabbi Esther was saying about adults with religious trauma, you don't have to be the only one who's talking to your kid about tradition or culture or faith or God, like get your friends, get your aunties and your uncles, like lean, lean on the community. And they don't have to be church people or synagogue people or like any other kind of faith people. They can be your neighbors. They can be the, the parents you meet on the playground and like creating these spaces where there are other folks who are offering some meaningful guidance into these big questions, especially when there's a history of religious trauma. It doesn't all have to come down as a burden of parents, right? But, but we, but we hope there's this shared burden of responsibility in caring for our children. You know, in our work at Springtide, that's one of the things that we remind parents and trusted adults about. We have kind of this magic number. If a kid has five trusted adults, at least in their lives, then they have, you know, much less um, incident of mental health challenges, especially, but just have a greater sense of belonging. We tell them, mom and dad, that doesn't just have to be you. The onus does not fall on you here to make sure that all of these things ha uh, fall into place. Absolutely. Reverend Natalie, did you have something you wanted to add on this? I was just thinking, you know, listening to you all talk about this. Um, in the book and in the movie, um, Margaret is given the choice, like she'll choose this later sort of thing, which is a thing that they are doing everywhere in her life, right? But this is the only place where she doesn't have information. And I just find that so interesting that she decides not to wear socks and her mom gives her information about, hey, so you can make this choice, but here's probably what might happen. Like, I don't know, you know what I mean? But when it comes to this thing, you know, when we're talking about like, the trauma response inside of you that doesn't let you like think through what actually might be helpful in a situation or the ad, the religious um, adverse person who is just being more casual about it. Um, what then does the child have to reconcile with, you know? And so Margaret is left to figure it out on her own without any, any guidelines at all, right? So she like goes to, synagogue and just is like okay well what are we doing you know <laughs> her, her grandmother is like it's fine it's fine you're fine and then she goes to church with her friend for easter and it's all you know it's all the same kind of no information just exposure without context space um that i think you all have really named here and i just i wanted to just add that little piece about how there are other spaces, places where community was super important, where um, context was very key, where, you know, they're actively building this for Margaret, but in this one place because of their own stuff, right? She's kind of left, left out to um, her own devices and left out to the wolves ultimately around it. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, back in Margaret's day, there wasn't the internet. So now when people have a void for information, there's a big old browser window and they can just type in and all sorts of things might pop up and they might not have the level of discernment to understand what is good, bad, right, wrong, indifferent, all of those exactly, things. Exactly. We could have a whole call about, <laughs> about just that. Yeah. Uh, but I will pick on you again, Reverend Natalie, because in closing, I would like for us to talk about advice. Um, 
what advice would you give to parents who have kids around Margaret's age who might be exploring their faith traditions um, or what advice would you give to young people who are asking these spiritual questions amid their own faith journeys? Um, um, I, I am team auntie as well. Um, <laughs> and I, I would say to parents, um, who have kids around Margaret's age, um, if there is a way in which you can encourage conversation, encourage them to ask questions, um, a, a safe place for them to say the things that, um, they might otherwise be too nervous or shy or scared to ask somewhere else um, so that they can at least have some, some foundation that they can build from. Um, and like any other conversation, um, giving them as much of the information as you possibly can that will make sense for where they are uh, developmentally and um, mentally and you know all, all the things like how how do they understand information at at this age and then so what does that mean about how i have this conversation i'm i'm a big proponent of um bringing the information in a glass in which people will drink from mm -hmm. right so <laughs> so like what does the glass need to look like in order for the information to be received um and for young people who are asking these sorts of questions spiritual questions uh amidst different faith journeys, I, I, I just say, whatever you can do to support that, to nourish that, like to help them feel like this is the best thing ever is to ask these questions and like reconcile for your, for yourself. Um, you know, we all reconcile our own spiritual life through, through, through uh, you know, trembling boldness. So, <laughs> That would be my advice, yeah. Just really nourish um, in any ways that you can and support in any ways you can. That sort of uh, growing and birth and, and, and um, uh, excited uh, journey, you know, life. Love it. Any other pieces of advice you wanna throw on that? That was pretty good. <laughs> that was pretty solid. Yeah, I love this idea that Reverend Natalie offers of bringing information in a glass that folks can drink from. And I think maybe my one addition to that would be like this this notion of a guide, right? As Dr. Angela pointed out, like there is no lack of information. It is so easy to get information, um, but context or a guide or somebody to help interpret or process that information seems super important. And again, like we've already said, it doesn't have to be a parent who is that interpretive guide here. I think the, the film models several other positive adults in Margaret's life, like Mr. Benedict, who says, hey, I noticed you wrote on your questionnaire that you hate religious holidays. Why do you think that is? Can you tell me more about that? And to sort of ask with open, gentle questions, or um, there, are these, there are these other moments where other folks ask her questions <laughs> that helps her uh, gain some more clarity um, in in her searching, right? So it's it's not just um, this gathering of information that she doesn't have, but somebody to help interpret that or to put it into a place that makes sense for her. So again, like find find your people, family, friends, teachers, mentors, um, and uh, to be aware of the ways that you just might need a team to respond to kids who are asking big questions and who you might trust to be on that team and, um, just modeling kind of gracious conversations, curiosity, open presence as somebody's asking big questions means that we have to deal with our own anxieties and our own traumas. And if there's something that's like triggering us in, in that space, that means like maybe we need help from therapy or counseling or a, a place to process that that's not going to place the burden on these kids who are asking big questions. But I love Reverend Natalie's um, just encouragement to stoke the fire. If kids are asking big questions, like it's, it is totally fine to say, you know what? I don't know, but I'd like to learn more about it together. Like who can we ask next? You know what I mean? Absolutely. Cause it can be so overwhelming, right? Like these life has these huge questions and, and you can help them to approach them, right. From, from a place of, of joy and excitement rather than, Oh my God, everything, there's so much, you know? 
I think that's such a, an important framing that will set them up for the rest of their life. Absolutely. Right. And even just to say, like, just because I'm a grown up doesn't mean that I have all the answers. Like I'm asking this question too. Like, you know what? I don't, I don't know either. I don't know either. Like, <laughs> like when I, when I think about that, that kid who asked me, why hasn't God done it yet? And I'm like, listen, I don't know. Why hasn't God done it yet? I, I don't have the answers, but I can promise I'm asking questions too. Mm -hmm. And I think having, having that sort of space, again, I think relieves that pressure valve where kids feel like they have to have it all figured out because everything feels so big. The stakes feel so high to them. And if you yeah. can say, um, in a way that kind of models that like sort of relaxing to say, you know, that's a really good question. And I wonder that as well. And then maybe we can keep asking some questions together um, rather than trying to rush in with like an answer or a solution or, or a program or a plan. Right. But just to sit with them in the midst of their questions feels like the important work in this growing space. Amen. Excellent. I love, I love this approach there's um it's reminding me of a moment in the torah in the hebrew bible where uh the israelites are receiving the 10 teachings um and the hebrew says na nishma which means we will do and we will listen and the rabbis of Jewish tradition love to talk about now seven ishma, like why should you do before you listen? Um, and there's lots and lots of answers to that. But I actually think it's the reverse in this situation in terms of like advice or guidance for parents. It's actually nishma v'naaseh, which is like listen, just listen, and then maybe think about doing later. But really, like, just give your undivided loving attention and your presence to kids, especially when they're having a hard time or asking big questions or having big feelings, because them just knowing that you're there to witness and not fix or change them um, can be such a, such a comfort. So nishma vinase is what I would say. Listen first and then do later. Beautiful. I want to bring up one piece that I, I don't think we touched on, which is I want to lift up Margaret's um, impromptu conversations with God. And and I, I want to think about um, young people having an opportunity to to feel to, to be able to just speak to some compassionate being and you know, it doesn't have to be in the framework of God, but for, it depends on how they, you know, what connects for them, but feel to feel that there's this compassionate being. And, you know, at the end of the movie, she gets what she wants. I don't know if that's really going to happen. Didn't always happen. Doesn't always happen for me when I speak to God. But, you know, these big questions around religion and finding ourselves within this organized stratus, uh, you know, stratosphere of religious identity and where do we fit and who are we? In on those in those ways, there's this other simpler thing that Margaret exhibits and has no. She just like she's like, are you there, God? I'm talking. I'm just I'm talking, and that's been for me a gift. And and I think as a young person, I, I think the things that they're dealing with, the things that I dealt with, they were scary and hard. And we need we need places. We need places to be able to share. Um, in a way, and we need to know that there's something out there that's bigger than us that we can feel connected to that doesn't have to be connected to the humans around us who that can't always meet us. They Unfortunately, they can't always meet us. Somebody said, you know, five adults in your life. And I went, I don't know if I always have five adults in my life. My kids don't always have five adults. And kids don't always have five adults, you know, and to, to be able to have, to be able to feel connected to something bigger and feel that compassion is a gift, is a gift. So. 
Thank oh, you. Oh, Rabbi Esther, that's so important. That's so important. I'm like, I just immediately flash back to my seventh grade year, like a, a church Sunday school leader gave me my first journal and it changed my life, right? Like that that space to to be able to express all of those big feelings, um, like not dependent on the other adults who could or couldn't be available to meet with me at the time. And as you're talking, it reminded me of there's a writer in the Christian tradition. Her name is Anne Lamott, who famously says that all prayers boil down to three words, help, thanks, and wow. And we see <laughs> Margaret like expressing all of those things, right? And so um, find, finding a way to talk to our kids um, in whatever religious tradition or practice they might be in and to say like, can you think about God's long and loving gaze, um, long and loving gaze upon you and turn the whatever you're feeling into help, thanks and wow, like that's prayer, that's enough, right? And to offer them those opportunities and to guide them into a place of asking spiritual questions in a way that feels right and authentic for them. Hmm. Love it. Love it. I know that I am grateful for this space today. We have obviously benefited from your time and your expertise and your brilliance and your heart for people especially young people. I would like to express my gratitude for your time and efforts and thoughts here today. Reverend Natalie, Pastor Alicia, Rabbi Karen, Rabbi Esther, thank you so much for joining us and talking about this important point in time and helping those who care for young people to care better. Have a great day. Thank you.